Absolutely. So now to just really put the meat on the bones about the decisions that were made and um, and why they were made. So the paramedic worked in conjunction with the family to ensure that they understood the need for the patient to be informed and be involved in the discussion. And um, following this, the patient, oh, sorry, the paramedic contacted the patient's GP to inform them of the situation. And it was discovered that the GP was not yet aware of the new diagnosis as the discharge letter hadn't reached her, but she did understand the complexity of the situation and the need for the patient to be involved. The GP also agreed that the paramedic was not the best placed person to break the news and that the conversation required a multidisciplinary approach and planning. And to add to the challenge of the whole situation, it was also at the end of the working day and the GP did not have the information to be able to plan for this conversation immediately to hand. The GP was, however, due to attend a multidisciplinary team meeting with the local hospice in the morning and agreed to raise the patient for discussion. Um, the paramedic agreed to contact the hospice to inform them of the situation so they could prepare from their end and gather information for the meeting, as allegedly, as we've discovered already, the patient was in handover from the hospital to the hospice. The GP advised that if the patient did not wish to attend hospital for the day's presentation, then community bloods and diagnostic tools were likely to be inconclusive or display unreliable results, and that was due to the complexities of the cancer. So the local hospice nurse was in agreement with the GP and they agreed that the patient required an urgent discussion to break the news or at least to be involved in the discussion, but that the paramedic again was not the best placed person to do that. Uh, the patient was added to their list to be discussed at the MDT meeting the next day and the nurse also provided a number for any future ambulance crews to contact if they attended prior to the palliative care plan being in place. And this to be really clear with both the family and um, on the patient record that it was to be utilized prior to any transportation to a care facility. The patient was informed of the potential non-cancer causes of the day's presentation. And then that led on to a holistic conversation and the journey, the care journey options for them. Uh, the patient then once again demonstrated full capacity and that the patient valued remaining at home with her daughters and receiving any treatment at home. She did not want to attend hospital but wished to be comfortable at home and that was stated quite clearly and the paramedic raised the idea of a lasting power of attorney and advanced care plan with the patient for them to just consider moving forwards so that they can explore, understand and record their wishes while she's still able to do so. The daughter had concern over the ability to then safely transport the patient home in their small car um, and particularly with the day's presentation and the spinal degeneration and the ambulance crew facilitated transport to the patient's home and ensured that the patient was left in a comfortable state in her own home with a robust worsening advice and plan in place to move the challenging situation forward. And that's the conclusion. See that, Tom. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, so I was asked to look at the opportunities and risks today uh, and exploring around applying values-based practice uh, within this scenario and, and more broadly. Um, just my own background is I'm a paramedic, but also work in, in academic settings. And, and what I try and do is um, understand how theory applies to practice. And, and uh, my own use of uh, values-based practices, I'm probably emergent in my understanding of it and, and trying to get a bit of a better understanding of how to apply it to practice. But for, from, from the reading and from engaging with it so far, it seems to be um, a, a really good model to be able to apply um, some broadly um, um, conceptual theories like values into everyday practice. And I think that the, 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 the ordinary language theory is really interesting in terms of how you take these concepts that maybe appear to be quite abstract and, and bring them into to reality in, in terms of your day-to-day -day practices. So what I'm going to do today is hopefully discuss that um, probably in, 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 in the general terms, and then we can use the discussion afterwards to, to talk through what the risks and, and values are. Um, what I find really interesting about value-based practice and, and one of the real opportunities of it is it's a way to actually ensure that you have inclusive practice. One of the opportunities you have, because at the very heart of it, it's about mutual respect of difference in values. So there were clearly in this scenario, some difference in values between the individual practitioner about how they felt the, the outcome of, of, of the treatment, uh, the the carer and, and the family member about they what they wanted and and the potential values of the individual patient that there are lots of values at play here and and 
the the whole process allows for that mutual respect and that immediately removes discrimination and and, and racism and, and area areas that that are fundamental to, to um, a difference in values, which is a really great position to hold. And often it can be quite hard um, how to actually inclusively practice and, and, and value-based practice a real good way of doing that. It, it, it focuses on a process rather than outcome. Often, um, and I'll talk about in the risk later, but often when we um, um, treat patients, if we go in with a predisposed outcome, we know this patient is terminally ill, they need to go to hospital because there are some red flags. That can be quite challenging in terms of getting a patient-centered care and, and actually um, focusing on the process of engaging on a value-based approach and actually engaging with the individual patients um, is really important because then you come up with a, a truly balanced, um, we talked about this earlier and, and Bill talked about having balanced decisions um, and ultimately it allows you to have empathetic interactions it allows you to have interactions with with individuals that are based on their needs and, and that's individuals within the whole spectrum of the assessment so that could be relatives that could be patients and that could be yourself but it allows you to interact on a more meaningful basis that there was there was um, sessions earlier talked about uh, phenomen phenomenology as well and and that actually is about exploring the meanings of situations and exploring how people uh, view and, uh, and interact within given situations. So, so putting values at the center of, of decision making really encourages that approach and allows you to have the opportunity to, to have um, patient centered care. Um, so patient centered care is a really important aspect of, of modern healthcare. It's a really important emphasis of how we um, ensure that we are delivering care um, to the patient. It should be every outcome as an educationalist, as a paramedic. Ultimately, I want to improve patient care. And, and this is one way of, of, of developing it. Um, I think um, Bill, Bill mentioned earlier that they are um, links in terms of evidence-based practice and values-based practice. Uh, from, from looking at some of the some of the literature often the criticism of evidence-based practice is either it doesn't um, use values at all and focuses if you think about the the the, the definitions of evidence practice where you've got the the um, uh, evidence patient expertise uh, practitioner expertise and patient values sometimes that patient values doesn't get included in the decision making process or uh, it doesn't understand the broad nature of values that values-based practice does and values are everywhere and, and they are more than just uh, one set of patient values. So it allows you to engage in, in decision-making that is based on um, a multitude of values when, when we go forward. Um, it, it also allows you to explore patient interactions deeper. Um, I think I mentioned in one of my comments earlier that there's a big risk within um, patient care that we, we, we only interact on a clinical level, that we only interact on the patient's observations and, and how they explore with us. But using this approach allows us to get meaningful interactions with patients, which um, is quite hard to, to teach. It's quite hard to teach undergraduates and actually using value-based practice allows you to teach a method of engaging with individuals um, based on their core value set. And if we can engage on that level it means that any decisions that are created from that are balanced across uh, the patient care uh, spectrum so the, the, the literature and, and Bill mentioned earlier about ensuring that balanced decisions are made so decisions are made that are that are balanced between the best available evidence between the expert opinion and between the um, the patient and, and relatives and, and when we come up with an outcome particularly that, that Antonio mentioned there that actually the outcome that was created was 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 balanced in, in relation to the risk and in relation to the patient's health care. Um, I think um, um, was mentioned earlier about um, paramedics. We probably have a predisposition to doing everything quickly and, and coming up with an outcome very quickly. And often there needs to be a deliberate approach to to using values that may take a bit more time that we're not used to in our skill set, and 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 ensuring that we we engage early in terms of values and use that as an approach to engage with patients it, it is really important. I, I think um, um, talking about some of the risks, um, a lot of the um, literature suggests that, that often uh, the obvious value clashes are, are noticed. So you might use an example of when we're looking at um, 
patients because they're religious reasons that don't wish to take blood products and the uh, practitioners viewing if they have a hypovolemic injury that that is the appropriate outcome to give. There is a clear values clash there between the individual's religious values and the practitioner's healthcare values and how they want to, to proceed. And often they're quite obvious and, and can, be, can be seen. But what is hard to notice is the subtle values that are at play in this situation. And without the dialogic engagement with, with patients and relatives, you can't explore those values any further. And, and if you go into a situation not understanding that there needs to be a mutual respect of values, it, it will and it, it will force you to go through a, a route where you only notice the big values clashes and actually you're not exploring the individual's ethical, religious, cultural values and, and, and actually you're not exploring your own personal values. Um, what, what I've um, uh, alluded to earlier as well is about um, there is a big risk that in healthcare we purely focus on clinical interactions. We purely focus with how we engage people on an observational level. And what I mean by that is their heart rate, their blood pressure, their SATs. And, and increasingly now, paramedics have probably moved from a position where we were um, quite transactional in our care, where we used to treat patients based on their clinical output. We were trained heavily on cardiac arrest, medical emergencies. But what you see now, and, and is a great example of this, this scenario, we are entering into very complex patient engagements that move beyond just clinical interventions that will resolve the care. And they move into a situation where we need to understand the holistic nature of patients. Now, now that phrase holistic nature of patients can be quite um, um, ambiguous and, and can be quite broad, especially to undergraduate individuals that come through learning pathways. And actually um, um, one benefit of, of using value-based practice is it allows you to put a framework on, on, on giving equal measure to values as well as clinical judgment and as well as expert opinion. Um, what, what it also does is it allows you to um, not own, to, to, to one of the risks is not applying your own values and be that personal or professional. We, we as paramedics have collective professional values. So we have our codes of conduct. Um, when I, when I work with undergraduates and, and, and some postgraduates, they will understand the HCPC code of conduct while they're going through their training. And actually they'll use it quite judiciously in assignments and, and use it to, to underpin their education. But when you get into practice, they're often a piece of paper that you don't immediately use within your own practice sense. What value-based judgment can do is allow you to incorporate those value sets into decision-making and incorporate your own personal value sets. Um, we are not automatons. We're not individuals that come to a situation with no um, understanding. Um, so we need to bring ourselves to that situation to be able to know what are our value sets and how does that interact with, with the individual situation. Um, my, my own um, personal approach is that I think this is a real great way you can apply um, theory to practice and you can start really great that we've got it now in the curriculum and we can teach it to individuals particular undergraduates that often find these concepts quite challenging to integrate um, this gives us a framework to be able to teach individuals on on how you can um, develop your approach and how you can ensure that you are making a balanced decision that is aware of mutual respect of difference values and and the, the ambulance service in particular has challenges with 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 um, equality and diversity in particular in relation to treatment of of staff and patients we are not are performing uh, very well in terms of that so i think one really good way to ensure when we deliver care that it, it is appropriate for an individual is focusing on the values having that dialogue with patients and having that communication with patients about how they feel um, in any situation and what their values are will mean that your treatment or your decisions or behaviors are then grounded in a, a really balanced approach when when you're moving forwards um, I, i've just got into understanding value-based practice and, and really interested in it and, and, and potentially use it in, in future research. And I think it's a, a really great way that we can tackle approaches and hopefully this discussion uh, and now we can look at some of the 
risks in relation to this patient that Antonio has gone through. Thank you.